Welcome to our episode of 71. 71. I was wondering how many episodes we would run of uh, silver lining for learning. Uh, looks like um, COVID is surging again, the cases. This is uh, not a good time to talk more about COVID, but we should talk about silver lining for learning. And in this episode, we are really going to have some host reflections of past few episodes. And we're sorry that Chris Didi cannot make it. He's, uh, um, he's, he's away from home and uh, he will return next week. And But this week, you know, one of the things that, that struck me, uh, I would really like to talk about, given our roles as professors in the schools of education and Apunia as the associate dean uh, in uh, uh, college of education at uh, Arizona State University is about teacher education. Last week, we had Rick Furtick and two other co-authors of a special issue of a journal talk about teacher education. But toward the end, uh, uh, Punia was talking about, well, we're not really addressing the real big issues in teacher education. So I want to invite you, Punia, why don't you get started with what are the big issues in teacher education in your mind? So I think, I, you know, last episode was really good in terms of <clears throat> and the work that Rick and everybody else did in that book, because at that point, when, you know, we suddenly were facing this pandemic, there was this need for understanding or, or just ways of how we can handle this, this situation, right? And what, how we need to work with teachers. So, you know, all the discussion that we had around the emphasis on compassion and caring and those four pillars that they had. I think all of that was really valuable in terms of addressing that immediate situation and context. But I think at the point, I think I was trying to raise that, that there is a bigger topic that we need to be thinking about. Because if we are thinking like Zhao, you have been arguing for, you know, that this whole idea of learners without borders, that what are the different kinds of roles that teachers can take? I'm thinking of the work that we are doing here at the teacher's college, one of our big initiatives is what we are calling the next education workforce. And so instead of saying that, you know, there is this teacher shortage, and if you think about what the role of a teacher is today in a K-12 classroom, it's one adult with a bunch of kids who have very diverse and disparate needs who might be in different points of learning. Um, and instead of that, can we go for a distributed expertise model where the expertise is distributed among an array of adults with a large number of kids? So that's a different way of thinking about education. Then we think about all these initiatives that we have around problem-based learning. We have you know, uh, project-based learning, or we have had episodes about play. Um, those are very different kinds of learning environments. And so if we have to think about that that's the kind of learning environments we want for our children in the K-12 context, then clearly it means that we need to be training teachers differently so that they can go and inhabit, control, be agents of change, um, be people who can actually implement that. But instead, if we continue to prepare teachers for the existing classroom, there is no way you can see that change happen, right? And so I know you work a lot with, you know, all of us here work a lot with educational leaders to get them to reimagine what classrooms can be, what schools can be to redesign those spaces. So I think there's a two way street, right? So the one is, yes, we are changing. We are trying to interact, engage with the leadership to get them to reimagine what school could be. But at the same time, we need to be also working the pipeline of educators who are coming in so that they are open and they have had experience of the nature that, that in their classrooms, they would be able to implement these changes because they have observed the value of doing so for themselves. So I'm thinking you know, of, let's well, say, yeah. one last well, point, you know, so I'm thinking of, and this is a plug for when I was at Michigan State at the Masters in EdTech program, where we would try to train, you know, the program would try to get teachers to think about learning differently. And so that the, the hope then is that they can go into these spaces and create these new learning environments. Anyway, I'll stop there, Zal, go ahead. No, 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 so, so because I want to get that and I'll get Kurt, because one thing you mentioned that's core to all our thinking is, current teacher education programs has a design. The design is that you are going to work with a group of youngsters. They belong to you. Then you are supposed to know what you are going to teach and you are supposed to know how to teach this group of students. So remember, we always have this classroom 
one teacher, a group of students. In a, so how do we change that piece? The other thing you mentioned that's important is, you know, with the technology, we have distributed already a lot of asynchronous instructions and materials people can access. You know, I'm, I'm always thinking about, you know, if you're teaching a group of students, of course, you know, synchronous is different, but at the same time, can we redistribute recorded materials, you know, flipped classroom has done this and to other places. So, but before anything else, I want to bring Kurt. Kurt, what's your thinking about teacher education? Kurt, you're on mute. I gotcha. Uh, I think it comes down to the three R's again. Robots, roles, and rethinking. So you talk about redistributing resources, all the R's, redistributing resources in this age of OER, the age of plenty in terms of educational uh, access to information and knowledge, if you will. Now's the time to reframe what we do as teacher educators, as, as instructors, uh, as schools, we need to revision, reframe, revamp. <laughs> all the first, so the first R has to do with just rethink what what we're doing in teacher education programs. We're not preparing them today for the past forty years. We're preparing them for the next forty years, and the next fifty years, and the next sixty years. They're going to be teachers, all right. So what's what's teaching and learning going to look like in the year twenty seventy, right? That's that's partly what we need to think about, you know, and, and, and who are the students that they'll be teaching in such, a, in, in such a year? More and more, they'll be teaching adults because they'll be coming back for retooling and reskilling and upskilling, uh, retraining. You see the budgets, you know, it's something every politician can agree on is putting something in for retraining and, 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 and helping the economy out with, with displaced employees. We haven't been successful at that in the past. And that's going to be, I think, a renewed focus in the future. We see a lot of things happening today with, with uh, stimulus and infrastructure. But the one thing that I think is going to come through over the next couple of decades is the stimulus and infrastructure for adults who are displaced or unemployed, disenfranchised, uh, and the youth as well. And so part of our re redoing teacher education is going to be rethinking who the learner is that they're going to be engaging with and impacting in some way. They're going to have to expand their mindsets from teaching seven-year-olds or eight-year-olds or 10-year-old students to be teaching uh, the lifelong learner to be teaching some, the skills that they're going to need to succeed in the year 2070 or even 2040. Uh, looking ahead 20 years, what will those skills be? Uh, and so I, I think there's going to be a heavy emphasis on philosophy of it, your philosophy of education as, as an instructor and your, your, your mission as a school and your learning environment that you're going to be creating. So the first R is redistributing, rethinking, and so forth. Second R is the role of the instructor. So I've been thinking, you know, we have to introduce ourselves to our students this week, Wednesday, our new students in the orientation. And I'm going to say to them, you know, if you want to take a course from a librarian, a clerk, well, you can take this course from me. If you want to take a course from a concierge and a curator, well, then you take this course from me. If you want to take a course from a, from a uh, uh, consultant and a writing consultant in particular, uh, then you can take my dissertation prep course. If you want. You know, I'm going through, if you want to take it from an event coordinator, uh, you take my 511 intro course, it's all events. It's all bringing in guests from around the world every week. So every, I'm looking at myself and, and looking at my classes and every class I teach, I take on a totally different role. And that's not how we're preparing teachers in the past. We prepare them for one role only. We have to prepare them for many roles. Uh, I've come up with 20 in one of my models, my education 2020 model, but we don't have to be 20 models, it could be five, it could be six. But education, if we were going to rethink it, we have to think about the preparedness of our teacher to be a captain on a cruise ship, if you want to, at one point, a curator in a museum at another point, a concierge at a hotel at another point, a consultant on a project team at another point, a counselor is, you know, giving 
helping people with emotional support during COVID, which they absolutely need right now. So the second R is roles. We need to re rethink how we're preparing them for the multiplicity of roles. So the multiplicity of learner being one, the multiplicity of roles. Third is, I was talking today, I was thinking to myself, you know, we had Chuck Zubin on a few weeks ago and at Central Florida, they created three types of classes. They had blended classes, they had fully online and they had face-to-face -face back in 2004 or 2003. They actually called them in this timetable, in, in the schedule of classes, they had them B's by them and, and uh, for blended and, and online they had O's. They actually had, no other university had this in their schedules back in the early 2000s. They were the first ones to do it. People thought they were kind of crazy. Now, in the year 2021, I'm gonna suggest that within 10 years, maybe 15, we will have R courses, we will have um, H courses, and RH courses. We'll have robot courses, human and robot courses, and human courses. You're going to be able to select. Do you want a human teacher? Do you want a robot teacher? Do you want a blended human robot? Uh, so that's my, my, my three hours for today is roles, robots, and rethinking or reframing. And I'll stop right there. So um, I'm going to actually be the question, you guys. So, so I was just wondering, Punia, you know, when, when Kurt was talking about the many roles, you know, how many roles a teacher can, can prepare, do you agree or do, where do you find time to prepare so many roles? Remember a teacher, you know, teacher's curriculum is, uh, and a teacher education program is quite crowded, you know, in the curriculum already. How, how do you actually do that? Or Pune, if you don't agree, if you don't like what Kurt said, you know, tell us how your programs are different uh, from others, or you're trying to make the next generation of teachers to be different? So two things here. So one is, I think there are two ways of thinking of this role. So one is in terms of metaphors. So, you know, you can think of a teacher as being a nurturer, a teacher as being an information source, you know, I mean, so that, those are the metaphorical ways. And then there are the actual roles. And all of us take on this different role. So I don't, you know, in different situations, different contexts. So I'm not as bothered by the fact that, in fact, I'll be more bothered by the fact that if we define these roles very precisely and so you've got to check each of these boxes, that to me is a problem. It, it has to be much more about developing mindsets and flexible ways of thinking that you can switch back and forth, right? So it's, it's that depending on the context, you can take on a different role as the need arises. So I'm less worried about that per se. I think that, but there is an interesting piece there about sort of these metaphors because the metaphors define how we think of, you know, so this whole discussion, for instance, that's happening around learning loss, the whole discussion, you know, there are certain underlying metaphors there which are driving how the solutions by, by get defined. In fact, defined even before the question is asked, you know, the, the, the way the question is asked is defining what kind of a solution you're going to be leading towards, right? Because the moment you have defined something as learning loss, then it becomes, let's, then it becomes a deficit model. Let's do this. Let's do that. Again, I'm not necessarily arguing uh, that something how you and I need to talk about because I've been thinking about the stuff you've been writing about learning loss and in conversation with people in India, um, that is a serious issue because these are kids who do not have the infrastructure at home and parental support and all that. So there is a significant learning loss, particularly in the early grades. So that's a different story though. But coming back to the issue of teacher education, I think that there has to be some kind of a sort of a backward design model that we have to come up with. So as I think that between us in these conversations that we have had, there are certain things to me that stand out as things that we value, that all educational systems should have. You know, they would be things like learner choice. There will be things like open-ended learning. There will be things like learner-driven education. You know, if it, you know, there will be things like creativity. There will be things like innovation. I think those are the kinds of things that, and that learning needs to happen in context. So you don't teach trigonometry just because it's going to be useful to you 20 years down the road. Trigonometry has to be emergent from some project that you're doing, which requires you to figure that out, you know, and, and so on. So... Uh, there is this great emphasis on creativity in the arts. Now, if we think that that's what the profile of a good learning environment should be, the question then we ask ourselves, are we preparing our teachers for that learning environment? 
Like, are we giving them the experiences that they think that, oh, wow, this is how learning should be. Why the hell were we doing it this way? Or why the heck are we doing it that way, right? So coming back to what we're doing at ASU, in ASU, the emphasis has been on this sort of team-driven model. So one of the things we have said is that none of our teacher education courses should be solo taught. If we truly believe in distributed expertise, in the value of having multiple sort of quote unquote experts or educators in that space, that our teacher education students should also experience that. And as you can imagine, that's a learning thing for us faculty as well, because we are very used to doing our own thing, not necessarily working together with other people to co-teach something, right? To co-design a class. So that's tricky. Uh, now, if you go to sort of the more, what I would argue more important and sort of what one could be in this situation extreme, where its students are driving the learning completely. I don't think our teacher prep programs are anywhere close to being able to do that, right? Uh, to support our teachers to have that point of view. It's only if by yourself you figure it out or you've had some experience like that in your school. I mean, how many of our teacher prep programs would have read anything by let's say Peter Gray or would have heard an episode with Bria Bloom? You see, would have heard or read Pasi Solberg and forget read Pasi Solberg, I mean, experienced it in the classroom, experienced it in a teacher prep program where the class is designed as a playground. Where do we have a teacher prep program where a classroom is a playground? Yes, there, I'm sure there are unique cases where faculty members who are trying different things are doing it. You know, I can see Kurt, you are trying a lot of new, you know, you always are trying new things, but that's not system wide. And that's why my question to them, one of the questions I'd asked last week was what were the systemic barriers? The systemic barriers are the Carnegie unit, the systemic barriers are the semester, the systemic barriers are meeting once a week for 15 weeks, giving a grade at the end. Those are the systemic barriers to, to reform, right? Well, Puneen, that, that's actually where, you know, your asked question, for example, have they heard of Peter Gray? Have they seen, you know, or have uh, they lived at it? a play? Yeah. Have they, have they lived seen? it? Forget, see, you can read. I mean, we have had so many classes where we are given lectures on constructivism. Yeah. Have right? they experienced? I mean, that's the ultimate paradox, right? So, so what, what, you know, here, here's a possibility for you as the associate dean. Remember, you as associate dean, you have power. Okay. So, uh, so for you ASU, you know, what if, for example, coming out of what Kurt's saying, what you're saying, what if we say, okay, let's diversify the experiences of future teachers during teacher education programs. If they're in our programs for four years or two years, why don't we give them a festival of events so they can experience children play, experience project-based learning, experience autonomous learning, experience children driving learning on their own. So, you know, you have like programs like that, maybe five weeks you're doing this, then you reflect on that. Don't teach them methods, but have them experience models of that. You know, very, have them experience direct instruction, have them to see the value or lack of value of standardized testing, and then reflect, debate, and discuss. I think that would be something very interesting. You do not do a course, you do, uh, you know, different items on a learning festival. You, you do this, you, you prepare. I think that might be something quite interesting that you can experience what Kurt's talking about, be a chef, be a curator, be a, you know, whatever you can do. So because I think right now, our your Carnegie unit is, is extremely on target because we're only talking about how many units have you finished? And that unit has to be a semester long, you know, how many hours you have to do those things, you know? So, so Kurt, you, you wanna jump in? Yeah, and I might actually have a slide to share here in a second. Um, you know, I'm thinking, you know, what made people in Saturday Night you know, Live so good was that they were trained in improv. We don't train teachers in improv. The way to get them multiple roles and comfortable with multiple roles, I, maybe a teacher education programs need to have courses in improv. And there have been articles in the Chronicle of Higher Ed about that, about the spontaneity aspect of, of creative teaching. You have to find your creative moments, right? So Kurt, not to interrupt, but when we were doing our urban STEM project in Chicago, we would always get Second City to come in and do an improv session with our teachers. Yeah. Exactly. And it was phenomenal. I mean, when you start taking 
you know, uh, how a cell makes protein from, you know, our DNA replication and you have people acting it out, passing on mitochondria, you know, it's, it's actually an amazing experience of sort of a kinesthetic way of understanding biology. You know, it's, it's phenomenal. So absolutely, I completely agree. So you're engaging. I go back to Young's point. He's talking about experiences. I was talking about events. You're talking about engagement. We have to go to not our words, but E words <laughs> this week. Uh, you know, I agree with you, uh, Young, about the notion of experiences. I was calling it events. A teacher organizes events. They organize experiences for engaging the learners, for engaging people in, in, in their own learning, in their own um, learning journeys, their learning pathways, if you will. So on, uh, one part of my Education 2020 model is about the roles of the instructor, be it a camping guide, a chemist, a chef, a cultivator, a concierge, a curator, a consultant, all the C words, Kurt, and all the C words. The other side has to do with, uh, with the, what I'm calling the last principles of instruction. David Merrill has the first principle, so I've, I've created the last principles, and I have a slide if I can show this. We'll see if I can share my screen. You can here. show it, yes, you can. Yeah, I'll uh, let's see if I can uh, call this up, and there it is. Uh, and now I assume you can see that. So, you know, I'm toying around with this Education 2020 model and, and what are the ways to activate learning? What are the ways that well, I call them the learning activation system template? The last, I have the last principles, the last model. And, you know, the trial and error. Bert uh, is the yeah. god of acronyms. That's all I can say. <laughs> uh, I try. Um, so, you know, you see, the, you don't have to use all these things, but you, the, since you became a professor, since I got into this gig, the notion of sharing has changed dramatically. Professors, teachers, K-12 didn't share what they did. They were working in silos. Today, it's become more normal to share, whether it's through Twitter or WeChat or Instagram or some other means with social media or just sharing your syllabus online. So a big one is just sharing to create that community of practice. But you know, choice and flexibility Punya was talking about there. Those are two of my 20 principles is choice and options and flexibility. I think if you had to eliminate 18 of these, I, I would leave those two in. You know, I'm not necessarily saying they're more important than any others, but uh, they're primed to getting us out of the mindset of directly instructing every week the same set of learners, the same boring lectures over and over again. But you know, there's 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 many other things. You're the expanded resources. Young, you were talking about that. OER is the notion of expanded resources. This podcast show or webcast shows as teachers can reuse as part of their expanded resources. Or if they go to use others, you know, TED Talks or TED Ed or NPR or whatever. So these are just what I'm toying around with. And, and I also have, um, as I said, 20 new roles of the instructor. And, and, and I've already gone through what, what some of those are. I could I call that slide up as well. I, I, I didn't get time to write the book, Education 2020 before 2020. We're already in 2021. I wrote three chapters and then other things came up, but I'm still gonna do it. Uh, at Bert, some point. the thing is, 2020 is hindsight. So I think you can still call it 2020, but in a different context. <laughs> or I got to be in 2025. You know? you well, well, Kurt, uh, you know, one of the challenges I have <coughs> with your, your principles, with most principles I have, so this is uh, Punya knows, uh, you know, where my take on this. So you make a list of everything. You sounds like Biden or Trump. You are promising everything. So, so you, in, in what you showed, there's nothing wrong. I mean, everyone is significant. Everyone is important. Right. So for you as a professor, you know, you've been a professor for a long time, so you can play with this. Yeah, we can have this, we can have that, we can have everything. Right. And I, I, no one can disagree with that. Do, do you see what I mean? Yeah. So I want to ask you, it kind of challenge you in thinking about what if I ask you to reduce? This is what Punya taught me to say. You know, when we think about schools, can we begin to reduce them? Can we take some of the stuff away, you know, from what you wrote, you, you wrote there? Yeah, everybody agrees with everything. But however, if we can't handle everything, what would you take away? Sure. And so if there's two things that teachers do that are, you know, not gift, not necessarily gifted, but are savvy instructors, it's challenge and support. Teachers just challenge and then they support you within those challenges. That's all we do. 
And, you know, as schools, I think schools have to respect the learner. And you might come up with a second thing, but, you know, respecting the learner at the school level and the teacher level and the classroom level is challenge and support. That's a Neil Vygotskyan idea. You know, it's just that we have system of learning process. That's all we do. We don't teach anything. You can't talk about Vygotsky anymore. Vygotsky is a communist. Yeah, Remember that, that that's the, that nowadays it's very hard. Okay, you can't talk <laughs> about that. Everybody owns everything now. No, no, it's <laughs> but anyway, go on. Yeah. So yeah. you know, you know, you those are the two things I would come down to challenge and support. You can have all the other things underneath that. That could be secondary level, primary level. Teachers kind of come up with a set of challenges. You could call it scaffolds, you might call it, you know, something else. You might call it activity prompts, maybe or something. I call it challenges. You know, and when you challenge learners, you activate the learning process, you get them going, but then you don't want lost learners out there. You know, you, you have to provide the supports as needed, the scaffolds as needed. So challenge and support, that's, you know, I, Punya, you agree with me or you have different two that you would come down to? You're on mute. Muted, by the way. I don't think I would disagree. I mean, I think that's the point that Zhao is making. It's like when you have, a, you know, it's not that, if I pick any of those two, you guys are going to disagree with me on that, right? Um, so to me, it's not as much about that as much as the actual practices and systems within which they're working, because those are the invisible structures which constrain what we do, right? Uh, <clears throat> I was listening to this podcast recently where this person was talking about all these things that are invisible <clears throat> and started by talking about, you know, quarks and, and, and atomic particles and so on. But by the end of the book, in the podcast, she was talking about things like, you know, economic structures, which we don't see, incentive structures, social structures, you know, our blind spots, that those sort of are more informative of how we behave and act than the more sort of, you know, the words that we spouse. So, you know, one of the things that I've always argued that in teacher prep, for instance, or teacher education or any education for that matter, we try to think that if we change people's beliefs, it will change their behavior. I think it's actually the other way around. If you get people to change their behavior, their beliefs will fall. And so that's why this idea of experience that Zhao is talking about becomes so important is that why, when you put people in an experience where they have to, in a tight amount of time, come up with a creative solution, and then they realize, A, that they have to depend on each other, that they know one individual has all the answers, that they have to work collaboratively, that they have to quote unquote, think outside the box. And then you have that process of reflection it becomes, oh, this was fun. Then the question, and I did learn a lot. I didn't anticipate that I would have learned so much. Then the automatic question, if you're working with educators comes up, why am I denying this to my students? So your changes in your beliefs come from changes in your engagement with the world. So our job as educators really is to change that. You know, so yeah. it, yeah, anyway, go ahead, Sam. Go No, because you, you know, like, you know, we, we minute, know in teacher education. What? Change it through what? I'm so, sorry, but Kurt, oh, I, I don't have to jump in here. I, I want to bring you in. When in teacher edu education, a lot of people don't believe teacher education changes anybody. Remember, that's the thing. They say, okay, those teachers, when they teach, they teach the way they were taught. Remember that, that that's generally be, believe that. I, I think the reason is that when they were taught, they had one way, but in teacher education, we did not allow them to experience other events exactly. or other Absolutely. possibilities. So if we, like Punya said, if we enable them to try various possibilities of teaching, you know, I've always wanted to run a learning festival, by the way. I just want all methods to bring there, have a week long, parents, teachers, kids, just come to experience all different possibilities. Maybe Punya, you know, maybe ASU, I, let's do it. GSP, Seriously, you know, I like that, that idea. No, yeah, I mean, because you just bring them in, right? I mean, just, yeah. just try it, you know, because a lot of people criticize things without knowing what it is about. They criticize right. it. They just reject that, you know, and they never had any experience, you know, to reject that. I mean, you can bring research on projects, on different methods, different ways. You know, I'm working now with a, a teacher in Texas to try to say, okay, let's ask about side effects. So if you, when you look at any intervention, what does it do? What doesn't do? How it helps, how it hurts. You know, why don't we guide teachers to go through that process of examining interventions like that? I'm sorry, Kurt, I, I jumped on you, but, but anyway, so that was just, 
I was out trying to get Pune to, to get in depth, which comes back to what Kurt, you were talking about challenge and support. If you want to be able to challenge people, that's not easy to challenge you. You got to know something to be able to challenge people other than saying, well, that's nonsense, you know. But don't mention Vygotsky is communist, you know. Nowadays, we, we are different. But anyway, Kurt, feel free to jump in now. No, I was just going to, I was going on with Punya and, and, and talk about him providing some examples for what he's saying. Uh -huh. Oh, what, what absolutely. What examples do you have? I've read a, series, a couple of different books lately. Um, uh, Marshall Goldsmith's book, Triggers, talks about that thing, behavioral changes, you know, be, to change mindset. You have to yeah, so this, I call this the, 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 you know, in Judaism, for instance, right? I mean, they, Judaism doesn't care about what you believe in. You know, I'm, I'm being sort of exaggerating here, but it's much more about the practices that you follow, right? And that the idea that as you follow these practices over time, they will in turn influence how you think and how you work in the world. And so um, the example that I would give would be <clears throat> the work that we used to do in Chicago where we would get teachers that are like cohorts of 50 over two weeks. And from day one, you know, you'd be given, uh, you have to make a, a stop motion video which enhances a scientific, not, not reduces, but enhances a scientific misconception. And you have 45 minutes. Many of them would have never made a stop motion video before, but they're working in teams. And then they start seeing, oh my God, in the process of enhancing a misconception, I start understanding what the original misconception is in the first place, right? And that's how you address it. Rather than hammer the kids saying, you have a wrong idea, you have a wrong idea. You push those ideas further. And what happens is after you do these, people start seeing like, oh, there are other ways than just. So one, and another example that I'll give, like every day, teachers would have to find something in the world around them that intrigued them. That's it. And then they have to do some research and come in. So I give an example and I'll, I'll share it on the, on, the, on the, if I can dig out the blog post. One day when we were cooking at home, some lentils, I saw this weird soccer ball pattern emerge. And I'm like, where the hell did this pattern come from? Another time I'm flying back from a conference, I see these rows of clouds, right? And turns out both of them are due to similar phenomena of movement of air and water due to temperature differences. So again, how do you, you can tell people be curious or you can find out things, but unless you actually have them experience that and then go and try to, and now you suddenly start seeing the world full of questions, full of wonder, right? So we used to call it the wow moment. It's the world of wonder. And if you are a science teacher, you should be seeing science everywhere. And if you're a music teacher, every sound should have meaning. If you're an arts teacher, every color should have an emotion. And if you don't feel it, you can't convey it to your students. And so, so that's the whole point. It's like you create experiences that allow teachers to see themselves in a new light and that then they will opt because they want to do the best by the students. I mean, I hate this sort of teacher bashing that happens. Teachers want to do good. And it's just that they haven't had, like you said, Zhao, haven't had the models of what that could be. So Punya, I, I love that idea. So maybe we can say, okay, forget about the theories. You know, in teacher education, we always have this theories, have all this. Let's just do create new learning experiences so teachers can experience them reflect on them, change what the view learning can be. Because, you know, as you said, if you've never experienced autonomous learning on your own, if you've exactly. always been told what to do, how do you know children exactly. can be on their own? You know, can, can learn, the right? only thing, uh, the only piece layer I would add to that, Zhao, is that the theory should come after the experience. Well, you reflect with the theories, right? Yeah, yes, exactly. You, because the theory, there is a value to the theory because it's giving us a generative framework. Right. It's giving us a structure which allows us to then understand our experience better. But we do it completely wrong. We just but, give but you way, a bunch of theories. We I don't even give you the experience after the I theory, have, right? I have to tell you this. You, you, you know, you remember in uh, at MSU, you have this uh, educational psychology for all students. You just look at those textbooks. You know, I, it, it's really, I have to say nonsense, a lot of them, because when we give teachers the theory, we're not really giving them a theory, we're giving them a name. Vygotsky said this. So when you do the test, you say, oh, Vygotsky said this, scaffolding, Vygotsky said, oh, you know, I, the I mean, there was no experience. You know, I would rather say, 
Don't mention okay. the names. You don't even have to mention the name of the theory. It's just you explain how learning can happen, you know? So I'll, I'll give you, so we did take that uh, course. It was TE 150 and Matt and I redesigned the class. So the way we did the first assignment of the class was a magic trick. So we'll leave that aside. The second assignment, we gave them a bunch of videos to watch. It was a montage we created from Hollywood films, from documentaries. And we asked them, what do you see? And they wrote something. This is an online class. At the end of the semester, we hide what they had written before. And we asked them to watch the montage again. And what do you see? If you don't find any difference between what you wrote in the beginning of the semester and the end, you haven't learned anything. I don't have to give you a grade. You know you haven't learned anything. But if you have understood these frameworks and applied them correctly and all of that, you will see very different things in that same video, right? Yeah. So that's how you're thinking about it. So you're not emphasizing the, the constructs just because they are being handed to you in, in a textbook or in a reading, but because it connects to things that you see in the world around you. Well, you, you're supposed, right? Because you've acquired a theory, it's a, it's, you know, right, right now when most people, even doctor students have this problem, they always write an author with a theory with a name. I've always said, if you change your mindset, is that how many names or theories you remember? You know, like people always say, I am using a cognitive constructivist perspective to analyze. I say, shit, I don't care about that. I just say, what, what does that mean? Do you even know what that theory means to you? How do you live a life? How do you drive instruction? You know, all those things. But another piece I want to say is this. You know, the traditional model of teacher education, we confine it to a class, a classroom, hampers teachers' ability to teach online. I mean, right now, you know, a lot of people say, oh yeah, we're gonna move back, we're going back to normal. Maybe, a lot of states, maybe. Look at uh, Florida, look at Texas, look at all those places, Alabama uh, and, and uh, Louisiana, all these places, you know. So I was just wondering about online piece. You know, we kept talking about online. If a teacher is one who can challenge and support, if a teacher has experienced all diversity of ways of teaching, interacting with the students, they might be easier to move online. Online is just a different tool. So I want to bring Kurt back. Kurt, you, you, you've been the online argument. Um, you've written a lot about open education. You've done a lot of those kind of things, you know? So you want to just chat a little bit about this transformation towards online and then transformation back towards a hybrid model of online and a face-to-face -face in the future. Well, first of all, I, I, I want to point out that we are able to say on this airway, on this day, in this moment, Young proved that we could say shit on the air. So thank you, Young. So I just, just want to point that I out. I did not the, say that. Okay, but anyway. The not, seven, not seven words that shall not be uttered on SLL. Okay, so <laughs> FCC is going to follow us. To be, be careful, okay. <laughs> just, just thought, I, that's what my ears heard. You know, and no, that was a Chinese accent. <laughs> you know, I, I'm I'm gonna back up a minute because I want to comment on Punya's before I comment on what you had to say, Young. I, I think Punya has so, something really important to say there, and that is that the activity comes before the understanding of the theory. If we do, in fact, ever understand these theories, we have to engage. And you said the same thing. We have to engage people in events, in activities, in experiences, and then have the reflection. And when you point out the reflection, the reflective piece is critical. So in my read, reflect, display, and do model, my R2D2 model, second part is reflect. It's the part that I did the poorest for 20 years until I started concentrating on debriefing and reflection constantly. And it's gotten me to a point where it's become second nature to what I'm doing in class with the students and getting them to be reflective practitioners. So it's a critical component. They have to have the action on it, but you have to have the reflective piece on it. And Punya, with a project I had 20 years ago called the Ticket Project, it was Teacher Institute for Curriculum Knowledge about the integration of technology. We blew it the first time, uh, Dr. Lehman and I, because we had them, you know, theory and teaching them stuff and all this. 
And you know, after a year, we, can, we it was it worked okay, but not as good as when we switched to have them do you know events in their classrooms and didn't do reflection until six months later, you know, on what they were actually accomplishing. And it was much more the people are much more willing to reflect on the theoretical components, the conceptual components, the philosophical components when they've engaged their learners and had successes, whether it's small success or huge successes. And so the model then becomes one of action, events, behavioral changes, Punya saying first on the front end, and then reflection on the back end becomes part of the cycle, right? It's back to Schoen's reflective practitioner. But I had many other things. We had wiki book projects, cross-institutional ones with Beijing Normal, with uh, Open U of Malaysia, with Houston, University of Houston, with, with other people, and, and having students write the books instead of read the books. And a couple of professors I met at Old Dominion had her students created the books. And then they had, they had 300 students in the class and they had a hundred chapter books that the students created. Each student wrote a chapter and they voted on the best one of the three for chapter one, best one of the three for chapter two. And then they read the book. So they've really got engaged through that kind of a model. But I've had students who create a journal in my you know, master's level or doctoral level classes, they created a journal and they wrote their, they did their own research into that journal as a way to engage them. I had my students create a conference, create poster sessions. So they're doing something, uh, YouTube videos, podcasts, all that. So I agree with Punya, we have to find those ways to engage the learners on the front end and reflection happens later on, if at all, they'll come to a realization of what they're doing if you're successful at enough times. Now I've chatted away and, and talked a lot. You wanted me to talk about what a uh, uh, blended learning instructor, uh, online learning. For no, online ho hold instructor. on, Kurt. Um, yeah. I have a lot more respect for you now. You know, you're great. You know, so so uh, especially given the the project driven. You know, you want your students. So that's what one thing. You know, Punya knows. I you know we all have trying to do that with uh, with our students right. and to say you engage them in something. So they can do it, you know. However, I just just want to mention that I'm sure Pune has experienced, you know. So our students, they come into our class. Many of them expect to take a class. What would you like me to read? What would you like me to write? You know. So so there was a what would Dr. Zhao want me to do? What would the, you know Dr. Mishra want me to do? So that that's really one of the things that uh, we have to change. You know, when students first come into the class. And I do want you to comment on, on online, but I say Pune has just unmuted. Pune, did you want to comment on that? No, I, I, you know, there is so much research to show that when you look at the first five minutes, if you ask students to evaluate a class and what the end of semester evaluation is, it's pretty highly correlated. So in some ways, the first half an hour that you have with any group of learners is the critical one. And usually we waste that first half an hour doing roll call, telling them the do's and more worse, we tell them all the don'ts, we read them the syllabus, we tell them plagiarism is bad. You know, by then you have lost the student completely. You might crack one or two jokes and get a couple of laughs and you, you know, and that's pretty much it. As opposed to that, almost in all my classes, the moment you, like the class start, let's say at two o'clock, at two of two, you are out of the classroom. You have been given a project to go out and do something and come back in 20 minutes. And that is something that activity is connected with the content of the class, but it just sends them out. And suddenly it's like, oh, this is different. And it's a completely deliberate move on my part. Like every, I remember how you and I did that when we were doing the faculty development classes, we would give them like rocks and paper and scissors and, and say, build some representation of knowledge. What it did right off the bat was tell them this is a different kind of a class where we will be allowed to play, where there will be exploration, where, you know, and so on. And you build a reflection at the end of it. Because if you don't build that reflection, like Kurt said, it just becomes a thing that you did, which was fun. But only when you build the reflection, does the story actually make sense in the bigger picture of things, that there is, a, there is an intentionality to it. It's not just play for the sake of play, but it is, you know, what in my writing I've called deep play because it's play with ideas, it's play with building things, it's play with, you know, putting things together in new ways. That's the kind of play that we want. And I, I, I think, Zhao, your point that it's that first, I've, 
I spend more time designing the first class, half hour of that class, than I spend on the rest of the semester. If I nail that, the rest of the semester, I it's going to go well because so, uh, they will be with me. Let, let me follow up with that. Again, you, I'm treating you as an associate dean with a lot of power. So if you, if you are going to Don't design, make that mistake. Well, but that's, that's another dirt word, power. Okay. So, yeah. so maybe uh, the, uh, uh, if you were designing your teacher education program the first day for all new possible future teachers, when they come to ASU, what would your first day be? Design the whole day. I don't, don't take courses, you know, imagine it's a cohort program, all courses were merged together. They just have experiences. What would that be? You can take your time to think a little bit about that. No, no, I'll tell you, I'll tell you right now, uh, because I just had this discussion with my daughter. She is starting the master's program and she went for orientation and she came out of orientation depressed and distressed. Instead of being excited all the faculty did and everybody did was keep grinding into them how much work this was going to be and blah, 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 blah. There was nothing about that. You're going to learn some powerful ideas. There was nothing about that through these, nothing about giving them some hands-on experience. I mean, imagine you're getting into a data analytics program and you are sitting in round tables and you are listening to a panel. Like, why were they not playing with data in that time? It's like, okay, let's see how many people are here who are blah, blah, blah. What kind of patterns do we see? That's what you want these people who are data analysts to be, to see data everywhere. And rather what you did was you bored them for a day. She managed to steal some uh, cupcakes so that she had you know, breakfast the next day. That was, I think, the only positive that came out of that whole experience. The fact that she could manage to take some healthy cupcakes home. You know? So yes, we would completely, I would completely redesign that day. From the what would be like? No, okay, no so cupcakes. Okay, now this is you know. Yeah. No, I think cupcakes are great. You should always have food. Food is not the issue. The issue is what is the purpose of this event? The purpose of this event, you are setting out on this journey to become a teacher or to become a data analyst, whatever. Now let's think about what does it mean to be a data analyst? What does it mean to be a teacher? To mean to be a teacher, let's take the two words that Kurt said. Kurt, what are the two words that you said that you think are critical? Challenge and support. Challenge and support. All right. Let's do let's make that the motto of our program. The motto of our program is as teachers, we challenge and support. Okay. Now make the day about challenge and support and have reflection built in. Like, how is this different from your previous learning experiences? Why this program is going to be the one which is going to challenge you and support you? Give them tasks in that little bit which they're going to fail at and say, how can we collect? You know, there are so many things you can do, but it requires going. Again, the point is out that you made taking away. We think orientation is about giving information. No, they can look that crap up. See, I have a version of the S word now, which I can say on, uh, okay. They can look that stuff up. What you are, what you're not, give, what the business school did not do for this cohort was give them an experience of what it means to be a data analyst. That it means I, I just noticed that patterns. you're criticizing so, ASU's School of Business. Okay, so uh, thank you for putting that on the record. record. Now. Okay, so that's fine. No, I can stand by that. Yeah, yeah. So no, no. But, but you see the, what the, I'm the, saying. So that's how I would design it. I would say, no. what is the fundamental principle that you build on, and let's. So, for instance, the example would be like in the Masters in a Tech program at MSU. It was explore, create, share. So every assignment that they would do would require some form of exploration, some act of creation, and sharing it out with the world. So let me ask you, this is a great model. So if, if I were running the whole entire teacher education program anywhere, you know, somewhere called CNT, curriculum and instruction, CNI, all those things, the first day, if we follow Kurt, you know, support, okay, and challenge, you know, we, we should really, like the entire day should be about an activity or main activities. You know, find out, you know, just go to a school. Let's send out, a, why don't you go to school, talk to some students? Why don't you go interview? You know, for example, I would start by saying, bring me back examples of learning. So you, you yeah. have to go out there, just look for them. You have yeah. to you, bring me examples, live examples of learning. Then we can chat, we can talk, we we'll go through that. And we have multiple levels of that. Yeah. 
Oh, one of but, the greatest. Uh, no, no, but, but, but now, Pune, I won't challenge you. What's stopping you from doing that at ASU? That's a conversation that has to be off air. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's go to Kurt. <laughs> but I, I just want to add one, like one of the most um, fun activities to do with teachers in particular is ask them for an example where they learned something that changed the way they looked at the world. Yes. And what's amazing is 90% of the examples are out of school. Yeah, and the I mean, question really, then becomes, the yeah, question then becomes- Just bring me back in a, 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 a lesson, why, example of learning. Why yeah. did your transformative learning experiences not happen in school? Uh, a structure that is designed for learning. Yeah. And if that's not happening, then we are doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think the, the, the teacher, you know, I never get into too much of teacher education, but I really feel, I, I wrote an article for the, for the uh, Peabody Journal of Education a few years ago. It's to really talk about new context of teaching and learning. I'm mean, really, this has to do with the curve. That's what I want to bring back. Truly today, even after COVID, knowledge is everywhere. You know, at least the knowledge in K-12 schools, you can find them, you can get them. Why do you still require teachers? to be certified based on how much they know, you have to be the subject matter knowledge. Remember under George Bush that that time of the no child left behind and how well you teach. That's still what we certify them. You know, that is you know, how much you know and how well you teach. So why is not all those knowledge or capsules or everything you saved on TED Talks, Kurt, you mentioned, on uh, uh, open education resources, on YouTube, why aren't there successfully used by teachers. Why do you have to teach instead of design activities? Kurt? There's a lot more information than knowledge online. And it's figuring out which nuggets are knowledge nuggets and, and, and which are informational pieces. And that's something that's real important uh, that needs to get imparted. Uh, I wanna go back for a second though. Yesterday I was at the Do Museum in San Antonio with my daughter and her daughter. Um, no, so I didn't say granddaughter, daughter and her daughter. Uh, and the model, so Punya talked about explore, create, share. You know what the motto of the Do Museum was? Learn, create, explore, almost the exact same thing. And it gets kids involved in, in activities. So excited to be manipulating, experimenting, you know, a lot of inquiry taking place, a lot of activity taking place. Uh, so it's great to see. I'd never been there before. It was great. And it's a place that she's been many times and wants to go back again. And, and can, at two, age two can recognize it and knew exactly where she was going. Um, so that's what we want to have in schools. We want to have places where they want to go. They recognize what is a, it's a place for activities, engagement, experiences, events, uh, and so forth. And they want to go there to build more. They want to go there to experiment within. And then I'll reflect too. I want to also point out my syllabus. I don't read my syllabus anymore. I have games around it. I do a kahoot around components of it. I have people line up. They line up in the room and they have to go to the front and then what's one item on the syllabus? And if they can't say it in five or 10 seconds, they're out of the competition. Next one goes up, what's an item on the syllabus? And then we're all done. They go sit down and talk to their neighbor about how they're gonna change the syllabus or, or we start with that. How can they design this? Next spring, not this fall, next spring, they're gonna, I have a hundred page monster syllabus. I'm gonna, my, I am not gonna create it now. My students are gonna create it. So I'm constantly thinking about new ways to get them involved in their own learning, as Punya says. So the first 30 minutes is critical, right? It's, it's the atmosphere in the classroom, the community building that you're, you have, the sense of caring, the sense of respect that you're providing the students that, that they can control some aspect of the learning. They can have some say in that learning process, not everything, but can have some significant voicedness within that. So have some parameters. You, when we're building courses, have some sense of openness, but not so much that it's chaos. And it's that that, that we have to teach teachers within teacher training programs, how to provide that sense of, a, of support within the system that enables students to, to be driven by their questions within the parameters of the overarching objectives we were trying to within that course. 
And so it's a both and with more emphasis on the learner than ever before. But the teacher is still important, right? And the curriculum is still important. It's just the students become more important. That's where powerful learning happens, you know? So I didn't answer your question and answer your one before. <laughs> what would you want me? Um, we, I think we should read Dante's question. We got five minutes left. Should we, should we try? She's, we only have a few people in the audience. We only have one question. Should we just read it? Sure. Okay, Dante says, I have more like a comment than a question. It's time to rethink education. Okay, Dante. In the education crisis where we live uh, lies so many opportunities for good changes. Does anyone want to add to that comment from Dante? Well, we've been talking about that. That's what the whole show is about, right? Exactly. The, the, so that's what I commented on YouTube. Yeah. The whole show is about that. You know, I still want to get back to this one transformation, teacher education. It sounds like, you know, Punia, Kurt, and Yong Zhao. The three of us have some common ideas. So if we start it, that's a one cohort of online teacher education. We start that. So can we get uh, ASU to agree to say, why don't you guys run that program? Let's say how many we can recruit, right? Doing online. You know, we're not interfering with other people. You know, we're just gonna run, a, you know, like maybe a, a learn, create, explore teacher education program online. We may get, uh, you know, Indiana University agree, or maybe Kansas can agree. What do you think? If we, uh, I don't I think I think it's going to be things. harder to do with teacher ed, but I think it'll be easier to do with in-service teachers. That's all. Just to, because of all the students? certification, because of all the certification, all those issues involved, you can make this a professional development thing and that's much easier to get off the ground. So maybe that's silver lining number two. And we run, we run a cohort of 10 students to try how it goes. That might be fine. Oh, it'll go great. I'm, yeah, no I'm serious, that. right? You know, it, it, because it'll be interesting, because I'm really interested in this. You know, when Pune, you were talking about design the first third minutes, design the third, you know, it, that's really improves our thinking about this whole process. Maybe we can run a cohort of uh, superintendents, principals, teachers. I mean, Maybe I should talk to Kansas. You guys should talk about Indiana. All right, so no, I, I'm, I'm, let's, let's, I would love to do one with leaders. So let's do one with leaders. Go oh, hard. Do you want to talk to ASU? Because this is, I think that, be, that, we are from different universities, you know. No, I, I don't can, know which that, one we that, just, that I can, I can, I should be able to get going. You sure? Okay. Yeah, pretty sure. Well, so, uh, Kurt, you want to talk to IU? Because I, I don't want to get everybody into something. They are not winning to. I am just interested in this idea, you know. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm game for that. that I'm game. Was for that. our our ticket program was in service and was funded by the Arthur Vining Davis Foundation out of Florida. They might have money. You might want to, you know, see the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations and you know. Uh, yeah, we could write some for some foundation. I'm just, I, I see. You know, I want to do things like silver lining, simple, easy. And no obligation. That's that's mm -hmm. really my, you know, I do not want people to be following me to say, you got to write this report, you got to do this evaluation. So right. I'm not really into those kind of things, you know. But we, let's talk more about this. Uh, and uh, so uh, let's, let's Pune, finish the show and then we can continue talking. Yeah, Pune, do you want to talk about next episode? Yes, absolutely. As we're getting close to time, uh, the next episode, 5.30 next Saturday, uh, will be hosted by Chris Deedy and all of us, of course, will be there. And the topic is STEM education in and out of school in the U.S. and internationally. Our guests are Mary Jo Mada, who is Creative Strategy Manager uh, at Google. Uh, she was the Forbes 30 under 30 back in 2016. And the other guest is Chelsea Roebuck, uh, who is with Elite Education, which is a community-based uh, youth development organization, again, around STEM education and the work uh, internationally as well. So I think it'll be an exciting episode. It'll be good to have uh, Chris back with us, um, having, you know, moved his daughter across the country or whatever he is doing this week. Well, thank you. This is uh, episode seven one.